So I want to talk a little bit about cross-border. On Tuesday, we put up a complex chart. I don't need to go through that again, but we all know, and there's a lot of people here that probably send money back. When you're moving something overseas, you're moving from one fiat to another fiat currency. It takes some time, and the banking system over centuries has formed a way to do that, to move from one money to another, or as we say, one ledger system to another ledger system through correspondent banking. And correspondent banking is, is a reasonably concentrated uh, business. Uh, one student sent uh, in the group chat uh, last night that there's only really 10 banks in this field. I don't know if that's accurate, by the way, but it is a very concentrated business because they're large international banks. Whether it's 10 or 20, it's, you know, and they can charge a little excess. Uh, because they have to have correspondence. They have to have relationships with all the local banks. And they're taking some credit risk, the correspondent banks standing in between, some credit risk of the local banks on, on both sides, in the US and so forth, and in, the let's say, Mexico, if it's between the US and Mexico. So one idea that's been uh, around, uh, it's, it's widely associated with Ripple, but it's not only associated with Ripple, is this simple chart. What if I move fiat to crypto and crypto to fiat? Is this called a bridge crypto or bridge currency? I can sort of say I can go from US dollars to Bitcoin or XRP. You, you, you fill in the middle and then move over to the other fiat, uh, Mexican peso in my example. Um, and might that take some cost out of the system. We have Sean's issue earlier of volatility. If the crypto is fluctuating a lot, that, that causes some issues. If there's a lot of cost or friction, because now you're doing two currency exchanges, not one. I'm calling crypto a currency for this purpose. I know that crypto is not technically a currency. Uh, but, but for this moment, let, let me just call it, you have two currency exchanges. And thus, you have uh, two bid-ass spreads to pay. Just the market makers, you need to pay the bid-ass spreads twice. And you have some volatility if the middle crypto is moving around. But this simple diagram is a big part of what Ripple is trying to create with X rapid, right? X XCurrent is a messaging app of Ripple's, and it's competing with Swift. And, and, and it has some reasonable adoption. A lot of banks are starting to use it. But don't confuse that <laughs> with another product, which is an interesting product that kind of does this, that goes fiat to crypto, crypto to fiat. So what problem, what pain points would this be solving if it worked in, in the um, cross-border? Anybody want to remind the class what the, Tom? Well, this reduces the number of intermediaries. You don't have to have your bank engage with a correspondence bank, which engages with a local bank, which then it, it, it sort of. All right, so it might. I'm going to say it might lower the intermediation uh, because you still have on the two fiat sides to a bank, a local bank and a bank. And to do the crosses, you need some market making function which in Ripple's case, they try to build into the application. And they have market makers to provide liquidity. There was a question, somebody mentioned liquidity, some liquidity. But it might lower the numbers of intermediaries. What else might it do? And there's usually between um, exchanging currencies, there's a balance between like the settlement time and like the fee that you pay. So if you want quick settlement, you have to pay a higher fee. Um, or you can accept like a lower fee, but it takes multiple days sometimes to Correct. change over, so potentially it could solve that. So this is basically a way that you can shorten the settlement times. This can be done literally in seconds. I'm not saying that you wouldn't pay a little extra for it, but this can be done very quickly if you have arrangements. So some contend, and I've spoken to them at conferences and so forth, that Big corporate treasuries are going to try to do this, that the treasury function of Apple and others might take this up. The big banks say that's ridiculous. The big banks say, no, we can provide 
real-time cross-border cash movement between dollar and euro and dollar and yen, and you don't need to interpose something in the middle. Wouldn't that require huge amounts of, of cash reserves to be able to protect against volatility and not only the volatility of the crypto, but the volatility of the actual fiat for that particular country? <coughs> So the question is, will it need a lot of liquidity, basically? You used a different word, maybe, but reserves. reserves. But somebody who can make markets of, in size in crypto versus fiat and crypto versus fiat, I think the answer is yes in terms of the only, the, only, the only probably token right now that has enough liquidity in it to do this in size is probably Bitcoin, even though Ripple is promoting this, and it's, a, it, it's sort of an interesting technology. They have a software, XRapid, that you can do this right now. Um, uh, they're promoting on XRP, uh, but is there enough liquidity? Could you move more than a million dollars? Probably not. You probably couldn't move a $100 million payment without moving the market a lot. Shimon. So back to finance. I mean, the only way so back to finance. It's good from a finance professor. The way this work is, is sort of subject to the cost of arbitraging this, right? You don't care about the, the value of XRP, provided that you're not validating arbitrage relationships between the two uh, fiat, right? That's so correct. If, if there, so whatever those frictions are, you won't be able to go underneath them. And, and if you're Apple, I, get, I don't want to see the, the, the treasury uh, business case. If you're Apple and you're banking with... JP Morgan Chase. I mean, they're probably quoting you, you know, the, you know, bips. I mean, like, what is the, what is the two major currencies? The spread is like in bips. A bip is a one one hundredth of a, a cent, basically. I mean, it's very so tiny. I, just, I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I understand the, the, So, so the proponents, and then we'll come back. The proponents of this say. Yeah, JP Morgan might solve Apple's needs between dollar euro, but are they really doing it between, you know, kind of dollar peso or dollar Kenyan uh, sure, currency? Let's say they're not, and, and the spread there is 10 basis points, 50 basis points. Well, that's going to be, by construction, the, the, the spread, you know, like that's going to be the violation of arbitrage that will be allowed if you go that way to. Right. So Shimon's saying there's, there's, there's maybe a cost and friction. Um, uh, I think the proponents of this would also say there's a friction in time, that moving from dollars to peso. Remind me your first name. Uh, my name is Anzach. Uh, well, that's definitely true even in pesos or any currency. Like All these quotes that anyone's getting are like extremely tight. But there's still a problem like weekends, for example. Weekends, they're just not quoted at all. So like, if there's a major event that's happening over a weekend that's going to change the value, of your asset or your currency, then you can't trade until Monday or Sunday, Sunday night when Hong Kong opens. And so there's still like these, like a 36 hour time period that is completely unsolved during the week. So the, the, the worldwide currency markets are depending upon banks, and banks do actually have holidays. Um, I know it's sometimes hard to believe, but, um, and so there's a question of, of so there's a question of friction, which Shimon would say, if it's, even if it costs you half a percent, it better get inside of that. Um, uh, there's a question of settlement delay. This could be faster. But you're saying they could change that. JP Morgan can change that. And then there's weekends. Do you have a 160-some-hour week? I'm going to go to Alexis and back here. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, because this system, um, like, in the, at the end of the day, like, it depends on the two FX rate, on the two fiat rate, on the like normal markets, right? right. So like even if we can't trade on a Sunday, like uh, the rate is going to change on the uh, platform uh, based on the like I don't know the assumption of like what the rate is going to be tomorrow. Like it's going to adjust. Normally you should adjust, right? Because as 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 has been raised before, like it's adjust for no arbitrage to take place. So like <coughs> even if it's possible, like. Doesn't this system like add more risk in terms of like two different risk, fiat crypto, crypto fiat, and just because there will always be the underlying risk of fiat to fiat, 
Right. Because it's always based on a like price on a private. Can I hold your question because I want to see if the other uh, yeah. yours comes I was, in. I got it. It's the risk. I was just going to bring up the accessibility for you know non first world countries or unbanked countries, and I would be less concerned about moving over you know moving like a yard and like be more concerned about like okay well maybe I have to transact like sub one hundred. Do you want to translate for the room what a yard is? I, 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 my Goldman Sachs days, I knew what a yard is, but some of the non-bankers. It's a billion dollars. Sorry. A billion dollars. Now you can work on, what trading floor did you work on? Cities. City. Now you can work on city. It's a, a yard is a billion dollars on Goldman Sachs' floor, too. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we measured it differently, yeah. Um, but I think it's... If you want, like, if you wanted to transact, um, maybe like under a hundred dollars from, you know, uh, dollars to, you know, whatever. Uh, no, no large bank is gonna, gonna open an account and do that for you. You're gonna have to do that, for like a commercial bank. If you have access to it, there's a really wide spread there. So if you do this through an app, through a stablecoin or Ripple or whatever, you're gonna be able to do it for for cheaper if you're making like micro transactions. So. I'm going to react and then try to bring it all together and summarize. It's the last slide. So, uh, uh, Alexis' point about risk. I agree. I think that all of these points are valid, that there is additional costs. There's two hops in this example, uh, and there's additional risk. So the real business case question is, is there enough value added on the other side? Are you shortening settlement cycles? Can you do it on the weekends when you otherwise couldn't do it? Could you move small dollar amounts, maybe retail? Because Western Union still charges something like 8 to 10% to do cross-border remittances. So send some money to the Philippines and do it only for a couple of hundred dollars, and you're, you're probably spending 10%. Could somebody build inside of those types of... Now, $200 movement, 10% is $20. You still have to bring transaction costs down, fixed transaction cost down. But if you can bring the fixed transaction cost down and, and, and deal with, have enough liquidity, it's kind of a, I wouldn't count this out. I'm one who sort of doubts it will be in the heart of treasury function that Apple will be using it between dollar and euro. But I, I want to say that there's the wide spectrum. It's just an interesting, can crypto be a, a, a bridge currency? And might it be in stable in the world of stable value? I, I hope, I mean, this was a good discussion because this is what the rest of the semester is about. We're going to take use case by use case and really debate. And through it, the learning objective is for all of us to leave with a little critical reasoning skills about when does an append only log with consensus amongst multiple parties and maybe a native token make sense? Mm -hmm.